Hi, Dr. Scott Watson here, and in this video, I'd like to share the amazing story behind one of Bach's most fascinating masterpieces, The Musical Offering. The date is May 7, 1747. The place, Potsdam, in the Kingdom of Prussia, about 15 miles from the capital city of Berlin. In the newly built summer palace of the king, Frederick the Great, the day was drawing to a close as it usually did with an evening concert in the palace's large music room. This would indeed be a memorable evening of music making. As it turned out, the musicians readying their instruments to play that night wouldn't actually get to perform. But what did transpire led to the creation of one of the most interesting and impressive pieces of music written during the era, later named the Baroque. Frederick named his summer palace Sans Souci, French for without care. It served as a retreat for him, his court, which included several musicians, and his often celebrated guests, mathematicians, scientists, philosophers. One of the greatest thinkers of the French Enlightenment, Voltaire, was a frequent, sometimes long-term, visitor to Frederick at Potsdam. Frederick the Great of Prussia, son of and successor to his more severe father, Frederick William I, was a talented military strategist who during his reign united several surrounding smaller independent states. Two years earlier, for instance, in 1745, the Kingdom of Prussia forced the surrender of the city of Leipzig, capital city of Saxony. But Frederick was at least as, if not more, interested in culture, knowledge, and enlightenment as he was in military campaigns. In fact, Frederick, this leader of armies, was also an accomplished flutist and even somewhat of a composer. How unlikely this would be today when our military leaders more often learn about competition and camaraderie through participation in sports. Johann Quantz, the most highly regarded flutist in all Europe and the author of a well-known treatise on flute playing, was Frederick's in-house teacher. Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, second son of Johann Sebastian Bach, was employed as court harpsichordist. Organ builder Gottfried Silbermann, a friend of Bach's, had been employed by Frederick to build as many as 15 pianos, or pianofortes as they were called back then. There were likely seven of these Silbermann instruments placed all about the palace, ready for music making. For years, Frederick had insinuated to C.P.E. Bach that he would love to have his father pay him a visit at Potsdam. Johann Sebastian Bach, now 62 years old, was perhaps the greatest musician of his age. At the time, however, his reputation was somewhat complex. His fame as an organist was great. His ability to improvise, a skill expected of organists of the day, was considered to be remarkable. But as composers like his son were crafting a newer, more elegant and less formally complicated music, that would eventually transition into the classical style, Bach's somewhat arcane music was thought of with ambivalence. Some viewed his music as the work of a genius. Others considered it a relic of a time and style that was fading. Being as interested in the culture and musical world as Frederick was, he must have been curious to meet the old Bach. No doubt Frederick was anxious to have old Bach try out his new Silberman pianos. For some time, Bach avoided making the 20-hour journey from Leipzig to the Royal Palace in Potsdam. Ostensibly, this was due to health issues, but it probably had more to do with the political situation between Saxony and Prussia. And so, at about 7 o'clock p.m. on the evening of May 7, 1747, as Frederick and his court musicians were preparing for their evening concert in the large music room of his summer palace at Potsdam, a court officer entered and handed the king a list of the travelers and visitors who had arrived at court that day. Taking and reading the list, the king laid aside his flute abruptly and announced in a somewhat agitated manner, Gentlemen, old Bach is here. Bach, who had stopped off at his son's living quarters to settle his things, was immediately summoned to the king. Without having time to change his dusty traveling clothes after his long journey, Bach was whisked into the music room of the palace and into the presence of King Frederick the Great. 
One observer recorded the flowery regrets that Bach offered Frederick for his unannounced visit and his disheveled appearance, calling it a formal dialogue between the king and the apologist. At once, Frederick invited Bach to try his pianos. Bach did not disappoint. With all in attendance looking on, Bach sat down and played, creating beautiful music on the spot as if pulling it from thin air. Bach was escorted about the palace from one pianoforte to the next, improvising new music at each, to the astonishment of everyone. After a while, perhaps wanting to really impress the king, Bach asked the king to provide him with a theme on which Bach would improvise a fugue without any preparation whatsoever. Frederick, who you'll remember was a flutist and composer himself, played for Bach a rather tricky chromatic theme that would have stumped composers without Bach's singular ability. This is that theme. Of course, being Bach was up to the challenge. After perhaps a moment or two of thoughtful suspense, he began improvising a three-part fugue. The king, pleased with the three-part fugue and perhaps wanting to test the limits of his theme's potential and Bach's genius, then asked Bach if he could perhaps improvise a six-part fugue. Douglas Hofstetter, in his amazing book, Godel Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid, explains, to give an idea of how extraordinary a six-part fugue is in the entire well-tempered clavier by Bach, containing 48 preludes and fugues, only two have as many as five parts, and nowhere is there a six-part fugue. One could probably liken the task of improvising a six-part fugue to the playing of 60 simultaneous blindfold games of chess and winning them all. Bach, recognizing that the king's theme wouldn't work for a six-part fugue, chose a theme of his own and then did indeed improvise a six-part fugue, amazing all who understood the contrapuntal feat they had just witnessed. The next day, the king took Bach around to visit and play all the organs in Potsdam, just as he had done with the Silberman pianos at the palace the day before. When Bach returned to Leipzig, he set about writing a six-part fugue using the king's chromatic theme. One wonders whether Bach felt badly about not being able to improvise the many-voiced fugue when the king had originally proposed the feat in Potsdam. Or perhaps he did it as a gesture of artistic courtesy and respect from one musician to another. I believe, however, Bach was simply intrigued by the problem posed by the very chromatic theme. In fact, Bach worked out this problem by using the king's theme to compose a three-part fugue a six-part fugue, ten canons, and a trio sonata. All of this engraved on a copper plate, printed and sent to the king as a gift, comprises the masterpiece that came to be known as the musical offering. Scholars speculate that the three-part fugue must be similar to the one Bach improvised that night at the Summer Palace in Potsdam. The six-part fugue was obviously Bach's answer to the king's request from his visit. The trio sonata, the most tuneful and accessible of the lot, was meant to be played in one of the king's evening concerts with Frederick on flute, Carl Philip Emanuel on harpsichord, plus a court violinist. The canons, however, reveal Bach's arcane intellect. Allow me to quote Hofstetter's concise explanation of canon. The idea of a canon is that one single theme is played against itself. This is done by having copies of the theme played by various participating voices. But there are many ways to do this. The most straightforward of all canons is the round, such as Three Blind Mice, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, or Frere Jaca. Here a theme enters in the first voice and, after a fixed time delay, a copy of it enters in precisely the same key. After the same fixed time delay in the second voice, the third voice enters, carrying the theme, and so on. Most themes will not harmonize with themselves in this way. In order for a theme to work as a canon theme, each of its notes must be able to serve in a dual 
or triple, or even quadruple, roll. It must firstly be part of a melody, and secondly, it must be part of a harmonization of the same melody. Obviously, writing a canon takes some mental rigor, but it gets even more complicated. Sometimes, to make a canon theme harmonize nicely when followed by a copy of itself, the copy must be transposed higher or lower by some interval. Other times, a canon theme can be fashioned to make musical sense when followed by an upside-down copy of itself. This is a canon by inversion. Canon themes that are engineered by the composer to work when played against a backward copy of itself are called retrograde or crab canons. What's more, because the first voice in a canon will be followed by some literal or transformed copy or copies of itself, it really isn't necessary to notate the second or third voice as long as the rule for performing them is understood by the performers. Canons were often written as games or puzzles whose secret had to be unlocked by figuring what time or pitch interval or other operation had to be used to make the canon work. Can you imagine looking at a theme, knowing it is a canon, but not knowing the solution? Does the second voice need to enter a few beats later, or a measure later? Must the copy occur on the same pitch level as the original, or perhaps two, three, four, five notes higher? Maybe the copy only works when the contour of the original is inverted, or perhaps when the original is played backwards against itself. The word canon itself means rule or law, and refers to this key to unlocking a canon. Bach employed all the canonic devices I've just described, and more, in the musical offering. In many cases, Bach composed a second melody to be played against the king's theme, and it was this counter melody that needed to be followed by some type of copy of itself to make the canon work. When Bach wrote the musical offering, he did not offer the solutions, though he did give clues. For instance, the first canon is labeled concrezons, Latin for crab. This refers to the way crabs walk sideways back and forth. This crab canon is a canon in retrograde, where amazingly the theme played forwards harmonizes with the same theme played in reverse. Canon number four is labeled augmentationum contrario moto. To solve this canon, the second voice will need to have its rhythm values doubled and the melodic contour reversed. In addition, the second voice must enter two beats after the first and five notes higher than the original. Thankfully, one of Bach's students, Johann Philipp Kernberger, solved all of the canons, which are notated for us in all modern editions. The Latin words in large, bold letters on the title page of the musical offering are similar to the canonic puzzles in that they have hidden meaning too. The words are Regis, Jesu, Cantio, e Reliquia, Canonica, Art, Resoluta. Translated, they say, At the king's command, the song and the remainder resolved with canonic art. If you take the first letter of each Latin word as an acronym, you get the word richer car. R-I-C-E-R-C-A-R. Richer car is both an Italian word meaning to seek and the more musically old-fashioned term for the fugue. In fact, Bach labels both fugues in the musical offering as richer cars. The acronym, with its double meaning, is so Bach. When you really think about it, it was kind of audacious for the king to expect Bach to improvise a fugue in his presence on such a chromatic theme. It was just plain ignorant to think that even a genius such as Bach might be able to whip out a six-part fugue. Nonetheless, I am struck by the respectful tone of the letter that Bach wrote to accompany the delivery to the king of his musical offering. It is from the first sentence of this dedication that Bach's collection of fugues and canons has come to be known as musical offering. In this letter, Bach flatters the king for his superb theme and stops just short of saying that if he were a better composer, he might have been able to deliver on the six-part fugue. We in the 21st century have a much harder time showing deference when we know we're right. 
I'd like to quote the entire letter for you in hopes that you can hear Bach's genius in the area of diplomacy. Most gracious King, in deepest humility, I dedicate herewith to your majesty a musical offering, the noblest part of which derives from your majesty's own august hand. With awesome pleasure, I still remember the very special royal grace when, some time ago, during my visit to Potsdam, Your Majesty's self deigned to play to me a theme for a fugue upon the clavier, and the same time charged me most graciously to carry it out in Your Majesty's most august presence. To obey Your Majesty's command was my most humble duty, I noticed very soon, however, that for lack of necessary preparation, the execution of the task did not fare as well as such an excellent theme demanded. I resolved, therefore, and promptly pledged myself to work out this right royal theme more fully, and then make it known to the world. This resolve has now been carried out as well as possible, and it has none other than this irreproachable intent to glorify, if only in a small point, the fame of a monarch whose greatness and power, as in all the sciences of war and peace, so especially in music, everyone must admire and revere. I make bold to add this most humble request. May your majesty deign to dignify the present modest labor with a gracious acceptance and continue to grant your majesty's most august royal grace to your majesty's most humble and obedient servant, the author, Leipzig, July 7th, 1747. I've always liked music that is attractive to the ear and to the mind. Music which when you hear it, you find it compelling, perhaps intuitively sensing that there is more below the surface than whim and fancy. All of Bach's music fits that bill in some way, but his musical offering does so, as they say, in spades. There are other keyboard works of Bach's that similarly, comprehensively work out an idea or concept. Take the well-tempered clavier, or Goldberg variations, or even the art of fugue, for example. Yet perhaps because of the circumstances, especially the part the King of Prussia played in its genesis, I have a soft spot for the musical offering. I really admire Bach's quiet power as he deals so humbly with Frederick. The King of Prussia has a superior social position, but yet Bach is certainly the musical superior. Still, Bach shows respect while, in modern parlance, blowing him away with his mighty feat of intellect, both in the music and the prose that accompanies it. There is another example in history of similar, though much more profound, humility. About 1,700 years before Bach's day, the most powerful man to ever have lived walked the earth as a humble carpenter. Nonetheless, he allowed a Roman governor, one with an ostensibly higher social position, to send him to a cruel execution, and in doing so, exhibited a power that set in motion the salvation of all mankind. I imagine that Bach was following this very example when in Potsdam and Leipzig in 1747, and every time he finished a composition, signing it, Soli Deo Gloria, all to the glory of God. The story of the musical offering with its many layers of politics, protocol, and musical puzzles mirrors Bach's music itself. I hope it deepens your understanding of J.S. Bach's singular genius. Until next time, stay in tuned.